Good morning. Welcome to day 11. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but today is our exciting conclusion of Exodus and a bit into Leviticus as well. Um, let me pray for us and then we'll start. God, I'm asking you for clarity, that you would empower my words to, um, that we together would hear your word as we work through the end of Exodus and Leviticus. Please bless us with a knowledge of your heart to draw us near. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, I know in the past I've talked to you a few times about uh, passages that have been significant to me. Uh, the passage on rest was really helpful to me in Sabbath. Um, the, the passage we worked through last time on Exodus 34, 6, and 7 also about revealing the character of God. Uh, actually, this passage was one of the first passages that got me interested in the Old Testament. Um, my original degree was an MA in New Testament studies, and I specialized in the book of Hebrews, and Hebrews pushed me back to Leviticus. And what I found there was something that my heart really longed for, um, because I got to see God's heart um, not just to forgive, but to cleanse. And that spoke to me in ways that surprised me. Because I understood the gospel um, at that point as I'm a guilty sinner and I need forgiveness. But the gospel is much richer than that um, as Leviticus unfolds it and it's fulfilled in Jesus. That not only is there forgiveness, but there is cleansing from defilement. And that spoke to something I think that was deep in my heart that I was kind of yearning for but didn't know how to put words to. Um, to be really frank, I think one of the things that addressed is when I was a teenager, um, my family was one of the first in the neighborhood to get internet. And when I tumbled into pornography, I not only felt guilty, I felt ashamed. Uh, I felt defiled, like something was wrong. So later when I came to faith, I understood that I was forgiven, that I wouldn't face judgment for my sins. But I think there was still a question deep inside me as to whether God wanted to be near, whether maybe there was something wrong with me, um, defiled in me that would, yes, he forgave me, but does he really want me close? And I think intuitively I thought yes, but there was still part of me that, part of my life that wasn't deeply addressed by the gospel. And this was the passage and this was the area where that really, um, address that and so I feel pretty passionate about wanting to help people see deeply what God's heart is in atonement. Um, so we're going to look at that today by looking at the end of the tabernacle. Um, you can read through the notes carefully and I would recommend you do that. I just want to kind of talk through some highlights in a more conversational way um, to help you and to highlight certain things. So very briefly we're at the end of Exodus and as you can see on your notes there the end of Exodus is dominated by the, the tabernacle. There's the brief passage about the rebellion where they build the golden calf instead of build the tabernacle, and they try to get God's presence in ways they control, which is ironic because God was giving Moses the plans for the tabernacle where God would be present amongst them, but ironically they can't wait and aren't patient, so they try to build an idol to get um, God's presence immediately amongst them. But from chapter 25 through chapter 40 of Exodus, almost the whole thing is filled with details of the construction of the tabernacle. First God gives them instructions, and then they construct it according to his command or according to his word. Um, so what do we make of this? One of the things we sometimes talk about in narrative that we haven't emphasized in this class yet is volume. By volume, I mean how much space is taken up in detail about something. So here the narrative slows down and gives so much detail about how the tabernacle is to be constructed that the volume of it forces us to say, what are we supposed to learn from this? What are we supposed to take away from so much detail, so much volume? Um, on one hand, a lot of people have gone towards a more uh, allegorical meaning. So they look for hidden meanings. So they would say, well, the, the color red means this, or the color purple means this, and the color blue. 
and there are this many posts, and that, that many posts symbolizes this. Or, um, you know, they, they look for a symbolic or allegorical meaning in all the details. Um, I'm not terribly persuaded by that. I think some of the things they say can be, present spiritual truths that are true, but I'm not sure that's why those details are there. So I think it's a little risky to do that. So what I want to point towards in this class for the end of Exodus is that I would say we understand the tabernacle best by looking in Exodus. What is its purpose that's explicitly stated in Exodus? And then we look how it, it is in conversation with Genesis. Um, the tabernacle, the saint garden sanctuary in Genesis, some of the themes are, are repeated. And then the most important thing I would say is how is the tabernacle used in Leviticus? When we see its purpose, if we understand its purpose, then the details make more sense. So that might not be fully satisfying, but I think it's a better place to start. And then if you have that foundation, if you want to try to go to a spiritualized meaning, um, that's okay. I'm not convinced by it, but at least have the explicit details or reasons why the tabernacle is given in Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. So. Uh, what are those reasons? Very briefly, um, in Exodus, the goal is that God will dwell in their midst. That's the conclusion. That is the good news that not only are we saved out of bondage and serving Pharaoh, we're saved into the presence of God to serve him. And we're royal priests and we can eventually, through Leviticus, draw near to serve him. Um, so the goal of the tabernacle is a place where God dwells with us. And thinking back to Genesis, that's what we were made for. Um, also in Exodus, um, it says that God will be with us so that we will know that I'm Yahweh. So this is another way relationally and experientially we come to know God is that he dwells with us. Now, one of the things I think is important then is this is a sanctuary and this sanctuary is in conversation with the beginning of Genesis, and I list a number of ways, and I've mentioned some of them to you before, but God gives the instructions in seven um, speeches about how to build this tabernacle, and the seventh one is about rest, and that recalls the first seven days of creation where God um, creates in seven days, it's through his speech, and the seventh day is about rest. Um, also, each of them have an opening to the east. Um, each will eventually be guarded by a seraphim, uh, which is an angel. Um, they have the same pattern where God first commands, and then there's compliance. So God says, let there be light, and then there's a report, and there was light. Let there be, let there be, and it was. And um, similarly, the tabernacle, the first six chapters are let there be a tabernacle, and in the last chapters 35 through 40, in some sense, and there was a tabernacle. I didn't put this in your notes, but as I'm talking this out, I remember also the first um, three days of creation are more of a forming, and the second three days are a filling. And similarly, the tabernacle is formed and then filled. Um, so in the end, Israel goes from building the Miskan, or the store cities for Pharaoh, to building the Mishkan, the tabernacle for Yahweh, and the God dwells amongst them as the place where we draw near to worship him, and also that's the, the seat of his authority. It's the place where he reigns from. So I would argue that redemption in Exodus is rooted deeply in a process to restore God's created plan. Remember when I had the jar and then we smashed it into pieces? Well, if we want to understand what God's trying to do to restore something, it's helpful to have the original image of, oh, it was a jar first, and then we smashed it if we were trying to put the pieces back together. Um, I think the original image, the original jar, so to speak, is a garden sanctuary where the people dwelled, Adam and Eve dwelled amongst God. So I think that's what's being restored. So... Now we're going to transition into, that's the conclusion of the story, but the conclusion has several layers to it. So on the bottom of page two, I put the verses there and several things happen. Let me just read this with you. Um, this is Exodus 40, verses 34 through 38. 
Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up over the temple, tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So I find this interesting that there's three layers. One layer is God fills the tabernacle, and that is the conclusion of the story. That was, that was the goal of the tabernacle, is to restore his people into his presence. And there's also a nice conclusion that looks forward that he's leading them towards the promised land through the, the cloud and the fire. So that's nice. But right in the middle, there's another issue that Moses is not able to enter into the, prom, or into the tabernacle. Sorry. Um, so that's a curious detail that everything else seems to come to a, a nice conclusion. But now we have a new narrative problem. Remember, we have setting, problem, or tension, and then resolution. We have a certain tension that God is amongst them. His glory, his weight of glory is present. But now Moses is unable to enter. So we wonder, why is that? And how is it can the, Moses and the people enter into God's presence? So that's the setup into Leviticus. So how, the question I have at the bottom of page two is, how will Moses and Israel draw near to God? And the answer initially comes in the first few verses of Leviticus. So if you turn to page three in your notes, the Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when any of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. And then goes into instructions. Two things. Um, as you'll see in the first three lines of verse 1, I've put in parenthesis that there are three different words for speech. These are the three main words God uses to talk about his own speech and the way he says things. So it uses the main verbs in Hebrew available for speech. So there's an emphasis here that God is speaking. Okay? And then verse 2, what is the main thing he talks about? In the parenthesis, I put the Hebrew again. The word for drawing near or bringing something um, is the same root word as the word for offering. So karav and korvan are um, built on the same root, which means to draw near. So essentially, our initial insight is God will make a way for people to draw near through offerings that are authorized by the speech of God. So it's through God's instruction and through his speech that he offers, that he authorizes sacrifices. And through the sacrifices, the people will be able to draw near. So what does that look like? Well, there, in the first half of Leviticus, um, there are two series of crisis and resolution. So let's just talk through that briefly. The first crisis is, God is present amongst them, but Moses can't draw near. So then in Leviticus 1 through 7, God speaks and he authorizes both a sacrifice and a priesthood. And then in Leviticus 8 and 9, there's a resolution as the priest um, obey all that God commanded. So there's a strong emphasis on obedience, doing according to the word of Yahweh. And when they do that, um, God's glory falls so that all the people see it, and Moses and Aaron are enabled to enter into the tent of meeting, and the cult is inaugurated. Cult is a technical term meaning the sacrificial system. Uh, sometimes in modern English we use the word cult for an unorthodox sect, but in this case cult means the sacrificial system. So if I use that phrase, that's what I mean. So does that make sense? Crisis one. Moses can't enter. What does God do? He gives instructions that authorize both sacrifices and a priesthood. 
And in Leviticus 8 and 9, they follow those instructions and God's glory falls and Moses and Aaron now are able to draw near and the people fall in worship. So things are going well. Something is inaugurated or begun. But Leviticus 10 um, is like a mirror image of Leviticus 8 and 9. Instead of doing just as God commanded, Leviticus 10, Nadab and Abihu offer a strange fire that is not commanded. So there's been a strong repetition emphasis, just as God commanded, just as God commanded, just as God commanded in Leviticus 8 and 9, and everything resolves. But then, um, just like Adam and Eve, when things seem to be established, there's a sin. So here, they, Nadab and Abihu introduce a new crisis that the priests sin by offering something not commanded. And Yahweh interprets that in verse 3 of chapter 10 as saying, those who draw near me must sanctify me or may set me apart as holy. And they need to honor me or they need to glorify me. Um, so Nadab and Abihu have not done that. And now there's a crisis because God strikes them dead and that introduces dead bodies into the sanctuary. And as we'll see in chapters 11 through 15, um, God does not want death to come in contact with life. So he may, gives them instructions about living a ritually clean life. They have to stay separate from dead bodies and from certain animals and from like, they, they can't eat animals that eat dead bodies, um, things like that. Um, so the new crisis is Nadav and Abihu disobey. There's dead bodies and there's sin. So what does God do? He gives more instructions and says, you need to discern what's holy and common and what's clean and unclean or pure and impure. And then when they distinguish that, the end of chapter 15 is, says, you need to do this so that nothing unclean is brought into contact with the holy sanctuary. So there's, if you're unclean, that's okay. It's not a sin necessarily. But before you come into contact with the holy, you have to go from unclean to clean. And once you're clean, then you can draw near to what is holy. Conversely, if you are holy, you have to um, avoid becoming unclean. So that's, that's the way that it works. So, of course, we become unclean in various ways. So God provides rituals of washing and other things where you become temporarily unclean, but also there's uncleanness that comes from moral sins. So there's not just ritual uncleanness that's temporary and can be washed off. There's also moral uncleanness that comes from things like sexual sin, idolatry, bloodshed, things like that. And to account for that and those type of sins, the center, the resolution of the story is Leviticus 16, where God provides sacrifices to cleanse people and the sanctuary from their sins and from their uncleannesses. Um, so that's chapter 16, verse 16. So do you see the two, there's two narrative or dramatic arcs. Moses can't enter. God gives instruction. Sorry. God gives instruction. They follow it. And then God's glory falls in Moses and Aaron enter. And the second thing is they disobey, the priests disobey. There's instruction on clean and unclean. And then there is the Day of Atonement where the high priest can draw near, I didn't mention that earlier, offer sacrifices to forgive them and cleanse them. That's the center. And then page four, um, the second half unfolds out of the first half. The first half sets up the cult and gives the categories of purity and holiness in approaching Yahweh, the second half of Leviticus unfolds and it's about how holiness and purity are to be extended into the camp. Um, and so that the people become pure and holy and that living in God's presence, the, as you approach God in his holiness, you become holy. So that's a key theme from Leviticus is that God makes a way into his presence. For the pr high priest, he goes into the very holy of holies, but the people draw near to a certain extent. 
And by coming near His holiness, they become holy like Him, and then that enables them to live a life of justice and fairness. So if you read through Leviticus 19, that's where Jesus gets the command, love your neighbor as yourself. And you deal well with people who are poor and people who are foreigners, and you um, live an ordered and just life in the community. Okay. That's one way to understand the first half and the second half of Leviticus as a story. Here's the conclusion. So um, I know that this part is me talking a lot. Um, so if you're kind of zoning out at this point, I'd love you just to pause, pray, um, clear your mind of distracting thoughts, wait for bells to finish. And then um, I would love to talk through this next section because this is the part where I think is most important. Um, I'm going to draw on the board. Hopefully, you'll be able to see it. Um, I just want to lay out that there are only two narrative pericopes in the whole book of Leviticus. In Leviticus 10, we have Nadab and Abihu. And we have this story. Maybe I'll use a different color. We have a story. And it occurs at the altar. Okay, so where's the place? It occurs at the altar where man meets God. Okay, they sin and they, they die because of it. And then in Leviticus, well, on the other hand, over here, in Leviticus 24, we have a story of an Egyptian and Israelite father and mother who have a son who curses or blasphemes the name of God by making light of it. Okay, And, and what happens if you go to Leviticus 24 and read it is they, he curses God's name. The people hear it and they arrest him. They take him to Moses and say, what should we do? And Moses prays to God, and God says, the people should lay hands on him. They should take him outside the camp and stone him. So this is another story. These are the only two in Leviticus, or the only two pericop narrative pericopes. And this story occurs in the camp or on the camp boundary. So he sins in the camp. But they take him over the boundary and throw him outside, or stone him outside. And these two stories, um, I think, are placed here. Remember that God is merciful, gracious, and slow to anger. But these two particular stories are intended to, um, what to say, make us aware that living in God's holy presence is um, fraught with um, let's say we need to honor him. So, I mean, here, verse, chapter 10, verse 3, God says, people who draw near to me have to treat me as holy and honor me. And here, the blaspheming son is, he's cursing God's name. Um, he's dishonoring him. He's making light of his name. Um, so I think these stories are, are placed here strategically and they're intended to kind of wake us up, Okay. But God doesn't leave us there. He's going to enable an atonement for sins. But before he does that, he gives instructions that are related. So in Leviticus 11 through 15, he gives instructions about what is clean and what is unclean. So we have a set of instructions or Torah so that when we draw near to God, we will do so appropriately, in a clean way, in a way that honors him, because we're supposed to honor him as we draw near. And similarly, in Leviticus 17 through 23, there are instructions sometimes called the Holiness Code, and it's a list of instructions about what it looks like to honor God's name. As you read through it, you will see a lot of um, emphasis on um, don't do this or do this because I am Yahweh. I am Yahweh. And then every once in a while I'll say, don't do this or you will profane the name of Yahweh. So Yahweh himself is not defiled or profaned, but his name or his reputation can be. 
So because we are honoring God's presence amongst us, we live in such a way that represents his character and we become holy or set apart to him as he is holy. Now, how do you think Israel does with these things? Israel, we have two stories. We have two sets of instructions that are related to this story. So um, death causes defilement and uncleanness, so he gives instructions on clean and unclean. Similarly, the holiness code emphasizes Yahweh's name not being defiled. And here's the story about this son who blasphemes or curses God's name. Um, so they're, they're connected. But right in the center, because we know that Israel won't be perfect at doing these things, and because God is merciful and gracious and slow to anger, the center of Leviticus and the center of um, the whole Pentateuch is the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, there are two goats. And this is where I work. I really want you to, to focus on and, and think with me carefully. And notice we have two stories, and we have two sets of instruction. One story occurs at the altar, and this instruction is about approaching the altar. And one set of instructions about life in the camp, and this story is about life in the camp. And at the center, we have a story of atonement where God enables the sins and defilements of the people to be dealt with or atoned for. And it happens through two goats. Here's what happens. One goat, the priest, after he makes sacrifices for himself and his own family, he, representing the people, leans on one of the goats and confesses the sins of the people. And it says that the goat bears the weight of the sin and they send him outside the camp to his death. Okay? So one goes outside the camp to his death and he bears the guilt of the people so that they can be forgiven. They don't have to experience the punishment of, that they deserve for their death. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a story real quick related to that, related to guilt and punishment. We know that guilt um, is like we bear guilt because we deserve punishment. When I was 16 years old, my parents went away for um, maybe three or four days, and it was the first time they left me home alone, and I had a driver's license. So I was 16. I probably only had my driver's license for uh, probably about nine months at this point, so relatively new. My, parent, my friends came over, and we decided to go um, get some ice cream, and I went uh, we were going to go to this ice cream shop and everyone else left and I was locking up the house so I was the last one to leave. But I knew there were back roads and I thought if I go fast down the back roads, I lived more in the country, if I go fast down the back roads, I can get there and beat them. So I start going down these back roads and driving and it was a dirt road. And as I was driving down the road, I, I went over a hill, and as I went over the hill, it, became, it was steeper on the other side. So I'm looking down, I'm like, oh no, this is steep. I'm going too fast. And in my inexperience, I hit the brakes really hard. And then I hit the brakes really hard, the car started to, to kind of go back and forth on the road, and eventually, I went down into a ditch on the side of the road. I went down and then popped back up. And eventually the car stopped. And I went out and looked and the front fender was smashed in. So the front right hand, hand side got hit. And I was so like shocked and afraid and nervous or whatever. And so I went and told my friends that I was going home. <laughs> Instead of beating them there, I was late. And I went home, and I still had two more days to wait until my parents got home. And let me tell you, I knew I was in the wrong. I was going too fast. And I knew there was judgment coming. And I knew I was guilty. It was like a, a burden was put on me and was laid on me. And for like two days, I just walked around like this because I was so nervous and I felt so bad. So um, 
what my parents did forgive me in the end. Um, but what I want to say is when we sin, we're also guilty and we bear our guilt. Um, there's a word for it, um, bearing our guilt, that the Bible uses. And the beautiful